paper, I mean, you're arguing some kind of point, right? Every one of them. It's not just merely tracing for me how somebody does something. You are, you know, if it's the, the development of the, from the child to an adult kind of a thing, okay? You are making an argument. You are saying, you know, many heroes, okay? You know, in fantasy literature, develop from a child to an adult because the authors want to show that kind of a thing, rather than just showing me how Taryn goes from being a kid to an adult, or showing me how Meg goes from being a kid to being an adult, or showing me how George goes from being a kid to still being a kid. <laughs> Not a lot of time passes. Adult on the end. He's still a 12-year-old. Yeah. Yeah, okay, maybe. Um, okay, so there's an argument. So whatever your thesis is, I shouldn't have to dig around and hunt for it. That doesn't mean you put it in cutesy type, as I've seen people do, or a cutesy color, okay, or you bold print it, or you underline it, okay, it means your thesis ought to be like, you really hate my guts, and you want to get into a knockdown drag out argument with me. That's what your thesis ought to do. It ought to be really opinionated. No namby-pamby middle of the road, oh, can't we all just get along? None of that nonsense, okay? It ought to grab me by the throat and shake me so that I go, wow, that's, that's really good. Okay? And then the rest of your paper, you just support it. You argue it. You support it with references, quotations from the books. So seven is a minimum. You can have more. doesn't mean you, you, know, you don't want to go overboard. You don't want to have 100. Okay? Because the paper ought to be minimum. 70% you, and I'd say 30% quotes. That's, I mean, sorry, maximum. That's maximum quotes. You don't really, because that's almost a third, folks. So, you know, seven-page paper, eight-page paper, that's nearly three pages. You really, you don't want to go that far. Be better, more like 20%. Because the quotes don't have to be really long. I do say in the syllabus, they need to be substantive. Yes is not a substantive quote. A single word, two words, three words really is not a substantive quote. A sentence, a couple sentences, not an entire page. I, once had a, I was working on my PhD. I once had a, a graduate student. Really dumb thing to do. She plagiarized from her textbook. Okay. I knew her textbook front and back. And she plagiarized like a page and a half. I mean, literally, page and a half. Included in the textbook was what's called a phonetic transcription of some passages of Shakespeare. And that pretty much was the dead giveaway, because she didn't even cite the phonetic transcription as being somebody else's. She just acted all like it's her own. And I, I just kind of wrote on the side, like I do in other comments, you know, how stupid do you think I am, really? I mean, kind of thing. So, anyways. Uh, I'll be in my office till about 1.45 today, and then um, again this evening from 5 to 6 if you have questions. If you have other questions about your papers, shoot me an email. Again, I'm usually connected. Those of you who emailed me late at night before, I usually reply if it's not, you know, after 11. Yes? Well, does this change the word count at all? No, word count stays the same. Just gives you more opportunity to give your ideas rather than, you know, copying and pasting what somebody else has said. Okay, that's still going. All right, so let's pick up with. Um, I have one question. Yes, sorry. Um, when we're doing starting our paper in like LF, LF, MLA format, do you want us to do to use the uh, eighth edition for the most current one? <sighs> I was afraid or somebody would ask that. No, consign that one to the lowest pit of hell because because that is horrible. Um, MLA citation. Did I include or sit out or put on D two L? Something like Sherman's Guide to Successful Papers for this class? No. Pretty, I did not? Okay, I'll do that this afternoon. If I have it on the computer, I have no problems. I'll do it later this afternoon. Um, that will give you a whole... I don't want to use that marker. That will be permanent. Um, that will give you a bunch of different citation styles or, or ways to introduce quotations in... 
um, side in. The one thing with this kind of class or with, or with you know multiple books by a single author, you can't just put, for example, Alexander 23. Because we've read five books, by the way, in Alexander. So unless you say up here, in the High King, okay? Because you've given me the title, you've given me the author. So I know if I combine those two, where to go. If you haven't said that, if you just, you know, Karen says, and you have the quote, and you finish it, and it's like this, you've got to do Alexander and then an abbreviated form of the title. Hi. 23. Or Cauldron. Or Castle. Or Terror. Or Book. Any one of those, if you want to do the full title, you can. Because if you're doing word count, you know, each full title doesn't <laughs> beef up that word count just a little bit, okay? So if you want to use full title, that's fine. Similarly, you know, with both Fletcher and Lingle, you've got multiple works. So you're more than likely going to have to do this with, with each author and that you use. And then when you get to the works cited page, you've got... And this will all be in that handout. You've got Alexander Lloyd. You put the titles, okay, in alphabetical order after you do the author's names alphabetical order. So you're going to have Alexander first because his name comes first. Then you'll have uh, Fletcher and then Lingle. If you if you were to do something from all three of them, okay. So then by Lloyd Alexander. You'd organize, you'd have the first one here, which is Cauldron, or no. Castle, of, uh, Castle. Book, of three. book of Three. So you'd have <coughs> the Book of Three, underline, place of publication, publisher, comma, date. Okay? Next one, you would do dash, 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 period. That means that's this information. And then you'd have um, Castle of Lear. That should be. That's not right. This first one would be the Black Cauldron. Because L comes before O. Then you'd have Book of Three. Then you'd have Castle of Lear. Then you'd have whatever. Okay. On down to the last one. Oh, so after you write out the title, can you also put a dash dash period for the place of publication? Nope. Oh, okay. Nope, it's just just here. If one of you, I know, has omnibus editions of these, so you've got all five in a single volume. Okay. Um, there, you do the same thing. You do the Black Cauldron. And then you would put, after that, whatever the title is of the omnibus edition. It's something like the, com the Chronicles of Prude, colon, the omnibus, or the co complete or collected edition, something like that. Okay? Um, and then you'd have that information for each individual title. And then for that one, when you come down here, at the end of this, actually, you don't put it in parentheses, you give the page numbers. Because, for example, um, Castle of Lear, which is the third book, is going to be, I don't know, something like 679 to 901. Those are the inclusive page numbers of that particular book. Again, the document I will um, send via D2L email and uh, on the announcements will have all of this. Okay? And then if you have questions, so you can send it to me. Because we need to, we need to get moving. Okay, so we left off, if I remember correctly, on chapter thirty-two in um, whatever this book is, Iron Man. And I want to pick up two o five. Okay, George is fighting. A siege, in, yes? One more question about the paper. Is it okay if the titles are italicized? Titles have to be italicized. Okay. Titles of books are always italicized. You just have an underline. 
It's because I can't write in the tones. <laughs> use underlining. You can also use underlining, but don't underline and italicize. Okay? Um, use underlining to indicate italics. Okay? Don't italicize or underline or put in quotation marks, however, your title. If you refer to titles of novels in your title, italicize those. But you don't do anything else with your title. You don't make it big. Again, no funky colors and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so um, chapter 32, Siege in the Sky. George falls off the roof of the train shed, page 204. And we're told he didn't lose consciousness in the few seconds of free fall. His mind remained as sharp as the glass panels he was about to hit. He's thinking, I'm about to die. Okay? His life didn't flash before his eyes. He didn't experience a moment of relief, of oneness with the universe. This page 205. He just felt alone. Brutally, sadly, irrevocably alone. Well, isn't that kind of how he began the first book? But he, there he kind of thinks it's good to be alone. He wants to be alone. And he just had time to think what a terrible waste this was. How terrible it was to have wasted such a precious, such a precious and extraordinary miracle as life. Harry Potter has the exact same experience, by the way, in the final book. Christmas morning he wakes up. And he kind of thinks the same thing. Or at least the narrator says he should think that. He's feeling bad for himself at the moment. He felt ashamed at how little he had made of what he'd been given. More ashamed of anything he'd ever done or not done in his life. What does that mean? Ashamed at how little he had made of what he had been given. What had he been given? Life. Is it life? Is it this gift of being a maker that he didn't know anything about? As George accelerated toward impact, his last thoughts tumbled after one another, and they were these. He knew his father had definitely felt all of this. So notice, as he's getting ready to die, in an instant, he's thinking what? He's connecting with his father. Okay? And he knew his last thought had absolutely been of George. And he knew that the pain of that last thought had been unspeakable. And he knew that this was just, that this just as surely, he knew this just as surely as he knew he had gone to sleep every night since, wishing for just one last word with his dad. He thought of his mother and remembered the good times and laughter and realized, just as he ran out of hair and hit something solid, that she would now spend her life unable to say, those last words to him. And the sudden pain of that realization was worse than the impact. <laughs> Why? Well, the impact wasn't too bad. Because what was the impact? The gargoyle caught him. Spout caught him. Okay? So, George, being carried around by Spout, in 207, Spout says, Go, Eigengang. Go. George got it. I can go. You're calling me Iron Hand. And Spout kind of rolls his eyes like, oh, man, how stupid are you, kid? All right. So Spout rescues him in that situation. We're going to skip on a bunch. The rest of that chapter we're going to skip and go on to the next chapter. Tragedy is with Edie, and bottom of 222, what does she know or think about tragedy? Hold on, I need to remember to set a timer so I don't forget. Oh, there we are. There is something in his eyes, bottom of 222, that she hadn't seen before. He still had the cocky urchin's grin, but his eyes didn't match the look. His eyes weren't grinning. They were saying something completely different, something not cheery or chirpy or cheeky. 
What was I saying? They were saying sorry. They were saying sorry. He's not a bad man. He's always looking after Glintz. He told me. He said no one looks after them better. Who's he talking about? The walker. What's little tragedy's problem? He lies. Is he lying here? Or it might be naive. Yeah. Little tragedy's naive. He believes the walker. Okay? The walker does look after Glintz, right? Yeah, he takes the heart stones from him, takes them down to that, you know, cistern and leaves them there. Right? So he's taking her off to the Walker's house. Bottom of 226. This was no safe house. This was the house of the lost. Then 34, we get the Houston mob which is a pretty cool statue. I've actually seen this one. Um, and they're talking about the goner and such. George is telling them, you know, he's going to make sure the goner, the gunner, not the goner, he's going to make sure the gunner isn't a goner. Back to the House of the Lost in the next chapter. And we see Edie, and there's a woman there who's, for lack of a better phrase, helping her but there's something odd about this woman. What is it? She sewed her eyes shut. Her eyes are sewed shut. Why? She didn't want to uh, glint anymore. She doesn't want to glint anymore. She doesn't want to see and experience the pain she has seen and experienced in the past. Okay. So the walker is coming. Chapter 37, Edie is speaking with the blind woman, and the blind woman explains to her why there are glints and why there are people like George, makers. Pages 260 and following. I was trying to use something from this for the quiz. Probably a good thing I did. <coughs> so notice how it begins. Long ago, before history began, before things had names, a darkness walked the earth. Fed on fear, wherever it walked, it spread terror and hatred and ignorance. Light also walked the earth, encouraging life. It couldn't bear to see its children live where terror and hatred spread pain and violence like a sort of dark canker. So it fought the darkness. And after a great struggle, it won and bound the darkness deep into the rocky heart of the world imprisoning its evil in the stone below so that it could never walk the earth. Time passed. Humanity rose. Humanity, who are the sons and daughters of life, therefore the sons and daughters of also light, spread across the earth, and they built and lived and loved and laughed. And as well as building, humankind made things. At first the makers, artists and sculptors, she says, Work with wood and clay, but their children began to dream of making things that wouldn't rot or perish with time, as wood and clay do. They began to create out of stone and tried to work metal in the fire. But making sculptures out of stone and metal was much harder. And because they knew nothing hard can happen without tears and sacrifice, they began to believe a sacrifice must be made to the stone they wish to use to make it easier to work with. In other words, Sacrifice a child to the stone, and the stone becomes malleable of sorts. And so, bottom of the page, there were still people, although many years had gone by, who had a memory that there was some ancient power in the stone. These women, for they were all women, had the sense of the power and memories, and Edie said, women like us. Yep, like us. Glints. Time had made them the makers. Forget that the power in the stone was dark. Page 262. And when the makers came to the glints, the women told them of the power, confirming it was a living thing. And the makers were happy because they knew how to appease living things. You give them what they want. Make a blood sacrifice. They drew lots. Chief maker's son lost. Notice, the chief didn't lose. His son did. Okay. Notice, he gets sacrificed. 
He doesn't offer himself as a sacrifice. Stone knife was used. No, because there were children of these were children of life. The blood sacrifice was to be just that. Not a death, just a little finger nicked with the flinty knife. Like in the one, you know, um, Pirates of the Caribbean movie, where you just gotta drop a little blood on the gold hoard and then you can keep it all. Unfortunately, we're told there was a mistake. Edie, did it work? You know it did. The oath between maker and stone was that the stone would not resist the makers, and the makers would use the power to work stone to make, not mar, that is, not destroy. But the flint dagger had betrayed them, perhaps because it was a blade of stone, and so had some of the evil hidden in it. Notice what that implies. Because the dagger is made of stone, it has some of the evil in it. So can anything good ever really come from stone? No. And it turned in the father's hand, and the nick in the finger became a gash in the wrist. Well, that's a pretty big turn to go from finger to wrist, even if it's a baby. And before they could seal the wound, the child was dead. Although it was an accident, his life's blood had run to the stone, and the bond between maker and stone was, the man killed his own son. He had killed his own son. But time passed. Makers made, the stone didn't resist. What they made had power, so what did they do? They make idols and gods and devils and gargoyles for their temples and churches. And these were the first servants of the stone. They were made to frighten and to awe. They were known as taints. Why? Because wherever their shadow fell, the children of light were tainted with fear. But they made the spits too. Yes, they did, she says. The likenesses of living things. Notice, spits can be animals. Okay? The likenesses of living things, of animals and people. They made things with a new intent to represent people loved and admired. Or even just to feel the sheer joy in recording that which they found beautiful and pleasing. And that's why spits aren't servants of the stone? Yes. They're called spits. Why? Because they are made as a spirit and image of real men. And so they have a kind of spirit inside them. And that's why the taints hate them? Because the spits are free? Eh, it's more than that. It's because the spits are the maker's revenge on the stone for taking the life of the innocent child. So the gunner, the woman is saying, is a form of revenge. Why? Because the gunner doesn't demand a sacrifice. They found a way to banish a fragment of the darkest and put a spark of life back into the world with every spit they made. In other words, the spits are made. They are intended to be good, to counter the dark element, let's say. And in this way, the battle between light and darkness continues between fear and joy continues. The darkness in the stone always waits for the makers to tire so it can return to the earth and rule again. And she says, and you know what? Or the walker says, and you know what? Fear always trumps joy. And darkness is so much more reliable than light. What's the problem with the walker statement, however? What is darkness? The darkness isn't like an absence of the light. It's exactly what it is. Oh, yeah. The darkness is simply absence of light. Light is not an absence of anything. Light is. Okay. So, he says he needs Edie to work her magic, her power, on some dark stones. Go on to chapter 38. Jump in several pages. To page 274. George has said to the Houston mob, he's going to help the gunner. Well, how does he do that? What must the gunner, what must all spits do by midnight? Be on their plinth. Get back to their plinth or they die. They'll never move again. So, because the gunner can't get back to his plinth, a substitute can be made. George offers to take his place. Okay. 
page 274. The officer tells George, if he doesn't take his place, what's going to happen? That crack's going to continue up your arm and into your body, and when it gets to your heart, you'll be dead. It's not all gloomy. You take the gunner's place like you said you would. You stand to until stand down, and you should be right as rain. That is, you stand there as long as is required. George, oh, okay, I get it. So this is one of the duels, one of the contests. But... How does just standing here at midnight? And he's thinking, oh, it's easy. I can go stand there at midnight. That's not a problem at all. A little bit more to it than that old son. George, like what? What does it mean to stand to? To stand up straight, um, you know, arms at your sides. To face what comes. The officer gestured to the tortured relief <laughs> carvings ringing the monument. Well, what are the relief carvings of? The battle. Battle. All that, I'm afraid. Carnage, slaughter, screaming fear, bloody waste of good men and horses. We stand to and relive it every night. So when the gunner isn't off gallivanting with George and Edie, when he's standing on his plinth, this is what happens every night. It's who we are. It reminds us why we're here. It's the maker's purpose. George, but it, it can't be that bad. I mean, you know you're going to survive, right? I mean, you do it every night. So George is thinking, you're a statue. You're a statue now. You were one yesterday. You were one the day before. So you must have lived through every instance. It doesn't quite work like that. We don't relive it as statues. We, we relive it as the men we were made to represent. And while we're reliving it, it's real. We don't know that it happens every night. None of us do. Not even him. And who does he point to? The unknowns. The dead soldier with his covered face at the end of the monument. Who is he? Depends who's asking. He's whoever people want him to be. He's the unknown soldier. That's why his face is covered. So the bereaved can come and imagine he is their lost loved one. Good idea if you ask me. In other words, this Jagger guy, pretty bright, pretty bright person. He knew a thing or two about loss, mind you. He was a soldier. Jake J. R. R. Tolkien, in his is it the forward? No. In his introduction to the second edition of the Lord of the Rings, talks about World War I very briefly. He says, by 1918, two years before, I mean, the war ended in 1919, but a year before the end of World War I, he says, all but one of my closest friends were dead. So think about that for a moment. Think of all your closest friends, kill them all but one. By the time you are, let's see, 1918, he would have been about 25. Now, if you're going to do this, you're going to be a soldier. George, I'm doing it. He's doing it for a lot of reasons. But in the end, they all boil down to a simple one. He wouldn't be able to live with himself if he didn't. Why? Because what did the gunner do? Save his life. And in doing so, what did he choose? The hard way. Well, George chose the hard way, too. And the officer nods, good man, George. Stiffen the sinews and all that good stuff. Would George, beginning of the first novel, have done this? No. No, because he was a wimp. Okay? But the gunner's already said, you know, you're standing up tall. You're sticking your chin out. Do it for yourself. Do it for the gunner. Do it for whoever you like. Well, who does whoever you like become? His father. The unknown soldier. And don't step off the blasted plant. In other words, you gotta, you got to stay. If you still believe in anything, pray to it. Notice, it. Why? Because for the next hour, old son, you're going to be high deep in hell. In other words, you think what you've been experiencing so far is bad. 
<laughs> you don't have a clue. Right? So, look at the next chapter. Title, Happy Ending. There are no happy endings, says the walker. But then I expect you already knew that. <laughs> well, what kind of happy endings has Edie had in her life so far? Pretty bleak, right? So, pages 282-283, she doesn't know what's in the stone, but she feels its pull. And we're told, 282, she wasn't feeling the past in the stone. She was feeling nothing, absolutely nothing. The stone was not a recorder of past pain, whatever it had been used for. Whatever it had witnessed had gone into it and out into the void beyond, whatever that void is. It was as if Edie were touching the exact opposite of everything in the world around her. Because everything was something. She's touching nothingness itself. In other words, this is not a stone to be messed with. All right? The walker, you feel it? It's evil. Page 283. It's just different. The world is full of people who are too stupid to understand and use words like evil and unholy. It's a third thing. It's what? A way to power that only the cleverest and bravest can take. Who's he mean? Himself. Yeah. Me. Though who's going to be the one using it? Her. Yeah. Okay. Edie, can you feel them? She's aware of what? Presences. He says, do you see them? No, but they're there. All right. 285, paragraph that begins, it had been so bad. The next sentence, she had just touched something behind the scenes, something that humans were not designed to be conscious of, let alone contact. It hadn't been pain, but if her hand had been free, she would have taken the dagger and killed the walker simply for making her touch it. He says, that wasn't too bad, was it? She says, hey, that was worse. You think George can make a new mirror, top of 286. I know he can. Why? He's a maker. He's not a stonemason. He's just a boy. It's not a learned skill. He says, he'll be able to. And he won't do it for me. He will do it for you. He will do it to save you. Okay. Where and when will he do that? At the Frost Fair. At the Frost Fair. So she asks him, 288, why do you need me if you've already got others, if you've had others test the stones? Because the nature of the void in the mirror changes in time. It's as if whatever is beyond the gate in the mirror moves, as if it has been floating loose since it was separated from the second mirror. That's why having a glint and a master maker on hand at the same time is so fortuitous. What does he want to use the mirrors for? To bring whatever is out there here. Because he thinks he can control it. Right? Chimes at midnight. George is now on the plinth. Page 300 and 301. Hobbling his horses as if he's been doing it all night. He looks at the man hunkered down in front of the small fire. Had a cigarette parked in the side of his face. George could hear the pop and suck of his smoking without using his hands as he squatted before the meager blaze. Try not to think too hard about, the why, about why the man carrying one end of the telephone wire spool had not gotten up when he'd stumbled and fallen. George concentrates on the back of the man's head. Soldier had dark hair, same color as George's, cropped short. When he swept his hand up, George felt something tug at him in the pit of his stomach at the familiarity of the gesture. He'd seen that before. He suddenly, fiercely wanted this moment to freeze. He didn't want whatever was going to happen next to happen. Because whatever was actually going to happen wasn't going to be the thing that Tug had so treacherously hinted at. Because that was impossible. Okay, what's, what should George think at this point about what is impossible and what is not impossible? That Darlene knows at the end of the 
yeah, there are no impossibles anymore. The man picked the ragged stub of his cigarette out of the side of his mouth, spun it into the fire, then stood up, stretched, and turned. <laughs> Looking at George, George's heart stopped. Anybody would forget to breathe. Any throat would choke up so tight. Dead. The eyes that he knew so well, <clears throat> the eyes he'd known he'd never see again, crinkled at him. One brow rose higher than the other, just as George's father had before. Who you going down, mate? I reckon I'm younger than you. And the first bomb blows. All right? The gunner escapes. The next bomb hits. Page 310. George and the soldier are speaking. And the soldier says, takes you funny, it does, by surprise, it's like this. He waved the small, much-thumbed novel over his shoulder before pocketing it. As he went back to crouch over the kettle, that was now coming steadily to a, steamily to a boil. He carried on speaking without looking around. It's like a book, isn't it? One minute you're the ear of your own story, then your girl produces this little atom, and even though he's ever so tiny, everything moves a bit, and you see you got all wrong. You ain't the ear of the story at all. What you took for the center of your own stage isn't the center of any stage, just a space on the edge of a much bigger place that was there all the time, only you didn't see it. In other words, you're not what the soldier is saying. Here, I'll use this phrase. It's not about it. The soldier kind of begins his talk, saying, it is. And then what happens? He says it is. Well, what does he find out that makes him see that it's not about him? Then your girl produces this little atom. Oh, she's pregnant. Changes everything. Okay. It's all right. It's good. Makes all this easier. All this, this what? This sheer living hell they are going through. Okay. Makes it worse too. Why? But, but you know, even if some bloody whiz bang's got your number on it, at least you had a speck of a hand in something that carries on. In other words, you in your offspring go on. Okay. I mean, I ain't never seen a little mite, not to old, but if I was to stop one and never get back to bloody, She'd tell him all about me, right? If I die, she'll at least tell him about me. All right? Boom, boom, shells falling. Page 315. He suddenly knew, in a kind of extension of his heightened awareness, this is George, that this was an extraordinarily precious moment and that he had to take advantage of it before it was eviscerated by the next salvo of shells. What is George thinking? So he has to tell this man that he didn't mean what he said. He has to tell... This man is not his father. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean it. And he's going to think what? Blimey, are you freaking, you know, out of your mind? All right. He turns to look into his father's eyes, his mouth opening to speak, but the horse moves and obscures his father's face. Boom. 316. The bombardment was shaking more than the foundations of the earth on which he was standing. It was shaking his grasp on everything. Every time he heard an explosion, he flinched, and he knew the next one would be the one that blew him apart. Skipping a few lines, he realized it was only the other soldier's arm gripping his over the top of the horse's neck that was keeping him upright. He gritted his teeth, and then he heard his father's voice saying, Good boy, good boy, you're going to be fine. And even though the soldier was saying it to calm the horse, he was also gripping George's arm as he did so. That is, keeping George alive. <coughs> he found the iron in his soul and made his shaking legs do their job. In other words, George kind of really becomes the gunner. As he looked down and saw them braced and supporting him, he noticed the thing, the last bad thing, before it happened. 
His father's boots were like his. The only difference was that his father had broken a lace and had hurriedly mended it by knotting it at the toe. George knew what was going to happen even as his hand clenched onto his father's sleeve and he started shouting, No! Dad, listen, please! I didn't! The soldier looks at George. It's okay. What is George getting that he never had? His apology acceptance. Closure. It's closure. Yeah, it's his apology acceptance. The wall came in as if another giant had just kicked it down. The horse kicked sideways. He pulled his father's limp, heavy body onto his shoulders and staggered out of the burning debris into the open. Notice that. George carries <coughs> his father now. Or what looks like his father. He screams. Why? <laughs> Page 318. George's scream for help turned into a question. He heard the word why convulsed repeatedly out of his throat. An officer says, put him down, Gunner. Can't carry him forever. Put him down. George, <coughs> it's my dad. All right. Meanwhile, the Gunner, top of 321, death, he thought, would be just nothing. A big blank, full stop. A balance where the absence of life and hope was counterweighed by the absence of pain and despair. A final equation where nothing equaled nothing and all calculation ceased. But he doesn't die. So he doesn't really know what death is. Okay. Um, let's see. Go through or two. Chapter 47, The Challenge. George comes to 340, and he sees some boots, and we're told he knew those boots. The gunner smiles down at him. Hey, hey, you okay? Not really. <laughs> Good enough, says the grunt, says the gunner. <clears throat> There'd be something really wrong with you if you'd done what you'd done and felt all tickety-boo about it. Notice what he means. If you stood on that plant and you came, hey, I'm fine. You got a screw loose. George, I saw my dad. Yep, you would. Why? Because it was the unknown soldier and he put his dad in and then he put the unknown soldier. The unknown soldier becomes what you need it to be when you stand on that plank. So whoever that person is that you've not said your goodbyes to that has left, that's who the unknown soldier becomes. After a beat, the gunner pointed over his shoulder at the body line at the north of the monument. It's him, isn't it? The unknown soldier. That's why his face was made covered. So he could be everyone's lost one. So you just made him your dad. Must have been rough. He puts his hand on George's shoulder and looks away. George took a series of long, deep breaths. You want to let it out, son. No one here is going to think any worse of you. What's he mean? If he cries. Crying. Get it out. And an officer, <clears throat> the officer says, absolutely not. Couldn't think more highly of you as it happened. You know. George, I'm okay. In a not entirely okay way. Page 342. The officer, look at your arm. George, you completely forgotten. Why? Because he's trying to stay alive. The entire flaw had disappeared, leaving only a faint red mark like a scar. Officer, duel is a duel. You stood your ground. One down. He's got two other marks going up his arm. And the gunner thanks him. Save my bacon. And if you don't mind me saying, I reckon your dad would have been proud of you. And there we hear, we hear 343. The truth of it was suddenly there inside him. It was as if it had always been there, but he hadn't noticed because he'd always been looking the wrong way, staring at the pool of sadness. That is, he'd always been focused on the wrong thing. 
Maybe the soldier who had worn his dad's face had said it best. Maybe it was like being on a stage that you thought you were the center of, and then realizing you were on the edge of something much bigger than you. Whatever it was, George realized that a very big pain in his heart had gone, simply because he had stopped concentrating on it. And notice that its cure had been there, been right there all the time. George, yeah, I reckon he would have. It was as if, by not crying on the outside, all the tears had fallen inside and left him feeling washed and clean. And clear headed. Because now what does he think of? Edie. Got to rescue Edie. Right? So, they go off to the queen. In 346, George tells her, we'll take all the help we can. And she says, thank you, boy. Now, what I suggest, and George is like, no, we'll take help. You don't suggest anything. If you want to help, you listen. Because Edie told me about this. Notice George taking charge. She glinted it, and it ended badly. What's the thing George is talking about? Frosted air. Edie told me about it. What did she see? Herself being drowned. Well, I will not. Gunner, yeah, you will. If you want to help the girl listen in, the boy knows what he's talking about. Okay. Far cry from how he was at the beginning. And so we get the frost fair. And we get the gates in the mirrors. George hits the walker in the chapter Iron Hand. They go under the ice on three in chapter 51. Okay. The gunner pulls up Edie, and she's dead. Pages. Well, she's dead. Three, uh, chapter 53, Ice Devil. George has got the mirror halves, excuse me, the walker does. And the stone mirror halves melted their way straight down through the ice, because he puts them so they oppose each other. Melted their way straight down through the ice and disappeared, but not before something invisible, almost invisible, like a living ripple in the air, came out of the mirror through the door the walker had opened. And because that something was made of nothing, wrap your head around that for a bit, it needed substance to survive in this world. First things it encountered in the empty air were the ice devils kicked up by the spinning blades of the chariots. That is, splinters of ice. The queen's chariot raced over the pentagram. She leaned out, retrieved her spear, and as George looked back, he saw the invisible ripple take the ice crystals in the air and whirl them into a body. He says, faster, faster. 381. The officer. Did you feel it? Feel what? Something followed us back, said George, jumping out of the chariot, racing toward Edie. She grinned at him, but threw up a warning hand. A small blue warning stone had been made into an earring. George, nice earring. It was my mom's. Page 382. What was it doing in there with the rest of, and then she sees Gunner. Uh, Gunner asks, oh. She went mad. That's what they said. That's why she got taken away. She looks at the earring. She was a glint too. Yep. George said. Only nobody told her. And because she didn't know what it was she was doing, she thought she was losing her mind. So the queen says, the question is why all the other stones have faded, but it keeps blazing. The gunner. Those stones belong to glints the walker killed or sent off to die. Mad and loony men. Maybe it's still a light because she is too. George, a light? Alive? He looks at his arm. The second flaw that he had felt jagging up his arm when he accepted the walker's challenge had gone, and he, as he knew it would. He caught the officer looking at it too. One down, right? He stood his ground where? On First, plinth. on the plinth. Second time? With the walker. Where? On the ice. Or water. Okay. Edie, my mom could be anywhere. 
George. Budge up. Gunner could have been anywhere, too, and so could you. But we got ourselves back together, didn't we? Officer. Yeah, well, yeah, but yeah, we have another problem. Can't you hear it? And the ear silence. The city's gone very still. The clock just struck 13. Well, clocks don't strike 13. And then what else do they notice? Cars in the street? Stopped. What about the people that were in the cars? All gone. All gone. Where have all the people gone? Why has everything just stopped? The officer says, whatever we brought back with us, I don't think it's good. And the gunner sees the stone gargoyle perched on the very tip of the giant stone field gun on the top of the artillery memorial. He's afraid it's going to come attack, and George says it's okay. Tells them about Spout. And the gunner says, blame him. If he's one of us, we're really in trouble. All right. So we pick up with the first chapter, the very end. They're trying to figure out what has happened. And the officer says at the very end of that chapter, it's war. All right. A bloody meat grinding war, and we're going to be in the middle. What's the war between? Spits, Spits and taints. In other words, but this is a much bigger war than it has ever been had before. Why? Because now all the living people, they get shunted to the side. So this can be the, the mother of all wars. Bloody meat grinding war. We're going to be in the middle. Damn it. Queen, war's damned enough without you needing to curse it. Nothing worse than war, says the officer. The queen, you couldn't be more wrong, sir, page 16. There are many things worse than war. Some of them live in the outer dark that lies beyond the stone mirrors the walker escaped through. One of them followed us back here. And now things long feared, things that have never happened, will happen, and there will be hell to pay. In other words, it's like some, at least, of the statues have a memory of the darkness behind the stone, all right? So, next chapter, we see the clocker, and he's talking with dictionary, and clocker says, page 21, Um, let me back up a little bit. No, I'll stick back up there. The clocker nodded and licked his lips. No, as said, all clocks had stopped. Believe time itself stopped. If not stopped, out of joint. Reference to Hamlet. Have no idea what happened, no word for what this is. Thought you might. Right? So the clocker has sought Samuel Johnson's input. Johnson, no idea. But if time has stopped ticking, then we are in the after hours. And what that pretends, I, I, I don't know. Dictionary says, top of 22, time's never been out of joint before. That is, time has never stopped before. It's the boy and the girl, isn't it? He kind of mean, he doesn't mean it's their fault. He means it has something to do with them. The maker and the glint, they've done something. Plocker, or something done to them. Liked boy, girl plucky too. Okay. So, chapter three, fire in the dark. George and Edie have a weird feeling about what's going on and about something happening. Page 24. George has a strange sense of nausea and fear. Can't put it into words. But ever since they'd walked into this building 10 paces ago, he'd felt wrong, wrenchingly wrong. Out of place in a way that was like a kind of vertigo. And Edie says, it's the people who aren't here, the ones who disappeared. They're George. They're still here. Just not the way here in a way we can see. How does he mean? He means kind of Star Trekian. They're slightly out of phase. Like George and Edie are here, 
But the other people are like a second behind, which means they're not in the present, or a second ahead, which means they're outside this world. <coughs> George says it's like they're ghosts. It feels like ghosts. Okay. So they don't want to stay inside there because they're afraid they'll go do Ali. So they go back outside. They grab blankets and, you know, coats and stuff. <clears throat> Let's see here. Chapter 5. Edie is dreaming. Dreaming of drowning. And she's speaking with the queen. Page 34. Edie had explained everything to George about her misadventures with the walker and all that kind of stuff. And the queen says, you like the boy. Edie, yeah, but not like that. That is, it's not romantic. He saved me. He's like, and she couldn't think of it. The word she didn't use much made it all the more surprising when it found itself and popped out without her being able to control it. Family. The only problem is, what kind of family has Edie had? Um, her estranged mother and her maybe abusive stepfather. Her, I like the way you put that. Is it her estranged mother or is it her strange mother? Both. <laughs> yeah, kind of both. What about her father? Or stepfather, whichever it is. Or mom's live-in lover. Tried to cut her. Did he just try to cut her? Or was there more? We're going to see a scene here where it's pretty, pretty clear. He's got a cabin at the beach, and he does what there? Mm. He takes girls there. <clears throat> He's the one she killed, she thinks. So, you trust him? The queen asks. And she says, much as I trust anyone, yeah. That's kind of the problem. How much does he trust anybody? Nothing. She doesn't have a good reason to. Right. So they keep talking, and they wake up George because he's been allowed to sleep because he's you know he's done a bit. And we get chapter six, the dark horse. Um, which we're told at the very end because the dark horse takes on which is a a one of these things from the outer place, takes on the form of a horse of darkness, and we're told, bottom of page 50, it had walked the sleeping hours of men on four strong legs like this. It had ridden through their dreams, spreading terror. It was the nightmare. The mare that rides through the night. Chapter 7, Death at the Beach. Death came for Edie on the beach, but he didn't come immediately. Right? And that's where we hear the description of Edie being chased. She sees the train. She waves. She tries to get attention. And people, you know, wave back. Hey, how you doing, little girl? All right. Go to... I've got to stop in just a minute because that's kind of going to fall off. Um... Go to chapter 9. <clears throat> In Stuck. Right. Page 66. Let's see here. The queen keeps calling George boy. And she tells George, the girl drank. <coughs> that is Edie. She was dead. We all saw it, right? I mean, the gunner's giving her... Um, CPR essentially and she comes back but she was no mis make no mistake boy dead George I'm not saying she wasn't and my name is George not boy what does having been dead mean it means the barrier between life and death is weaker for her now that she has crossed it twice it means death will come farther into life looking for her than it will for you for example 
She's a fearless girl, but too little fear can be dangerous. All right? George, okay, I'll keep an eye out on her. It's more than that. She'll be changed. She'll favor the darker side of herself. That is, whereas she before kind of tried to flee from the glint side, now she'll embrace it. She may harm herself by the choices she makes. George, when my dad died, page 67, I didn't cope with it that well. Not well at all. It was my fault. My mom had me see the school shrink. George was surprised at how he was able to talk so matter-of-factly about the great unspoken pain in his life. He remembered the soldier with his father's face and the firm grip. He remembered his smile and what he had said. And then he almost gasped as he realized that a locked door in his heart had opened somewhere back there, but he hadn't had time to notice. And now, where there had been a black, treacly darkness, darkness, he felt what? Clean air and light flowing through. Why? Well, there's a couple reasons. One, what did George tell the clocker, previous book, the night that he spent with the clocker, when Edie was asleep in the belt in the uh, clock tower? He told the clocker what he'd said and done. And he felt better. He felt relieved. Why? Because he told somebody. And the clocker says, well, everybody can tell the time. Turns it into a pun. So what has George done? He's confessed it. And then in standing on the plinth, he kind of got to make things right. He knew he'd never stop being sad about his dad. But he now knew he wouldn't ever have to be changed or made less than himself by that sadness. In other words, for George, now it's become a strength. He's marched through the pain. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to stop there so that we can pick up with chapter 10 on Thursday. And you guys are going to do...